Good afternoon, John Kilroy here from the uh, Dublin Academy of Education and we're going to have a look at some history plans, essays for uh, you to do over your enforced break. Okay, so you will need your outfit, of course, uh, and uh, if we can open up them and look at the past questions coming up, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three uh, questions. This is the first part, we're dividing it into three. The first part is going to be Sinn Féin and what better thing to study now with the way they are in the news. Uh, are not on the news this week, but um, yeah, the big news of 2020 is the victory of Sinn Féin in the election, a really astounding result. And of course, I wonder does that mean that it will come up as a question this year in the exam? What were the fortunes of the Sinn Féin movement during the period 1912 to 1922? And then, not a lot of creativity between the questions. How did the Sinn Féin movement in the period 1912 to 1923? Okay. So really, we're looking at the start of the question 1912, but we do have to show some knowledge of Griffith's ideas. Sinn Féin was founded in 1905. Uh, Griffith's ideas uh, in that period. So we're going to do an essay plan for, well, both of them, because, um, you know, there's not a lot of difference between the questions. Um, what most people would do, of course, is focus on Sinn Féin 1916 to 1922 in this question, right? That would affect your mark. We're going to go for two paragraphs before 1916, and then four paragraphs for 19, uh, from the period 1916 to 1923. Now, you can vary that a little bit, but we do have to have stuff in before 1916, absolutely vital, because Sinn Féin wasn't a Republican Party before 1916. That's important. Okay, so we go for our model of introduction, six paragraphs, conclusion, an essay of four and to five pages, written in 42.5 minutes, okay? Two minutes for planning, 40 minutes for writing, 30 seconds to read over, you're on the clock, you know how difficult that was in the mock exams, so this is what you have to do. Let me get going, okay? So we're looking at 2013 and 2018, and we're looking at Sinn Féin. So I will begin, I'm, going to make, I'm not gonna make a circular plan, I'm gonna make a linear plan, a linear plan, okay? Yep, I might actually turn off that and use both sides of the board, okay? Now that we know what the question is. Introduction, about a quarter of a page. What am I going to write? Well, I'm going to straight away get in my main man, Arthur Griffith. A journalist by trade. Uh, interesting guy, you know. Uh, he plays a big, big part in that period we call the Irish Revolution because he goes, he dies at the age of 50 in 1922, and he's overshadowed, of course, his death is overshadowed, and his contribution is totally overshadowed by Collins, but Griffith is a very, very important character. Then, when he set up Sinn Féin in the year 1905, he was looking for what we would call a middle way or a third way now what that means is a middle way between republicanism the violence of republicanism by the IRB path to independence and the home rule constitutional path towards independence okay so rejecting the violent revolutionary republicanism I or B okay rejecting also the home 
rule constitutionalism has been too sort of, how would you say it, nice, too not as direct, you know, using the legal means, using the parliament. Home Rule had been through all this sort of struggle in the 19th century, the Home Rule Bill of 1885, rejected by the House of Commons, the Home Rule Bill of 1892, passed in the House of Commons, rejected by the House of Lords, and uh, it's not really making any progress in the year 1905 and then the subsequent split of the Home Rule Party. Now that had reunified in the year 1900 under the leadership of John Redmond. What was his third way then? His third way? His third way was based on a monarchy called the dual monarchy. The dual monarchy. So this is where he gets it from. And of course, he gets it from our European neighbours. The, uh, the example was the Austro Hungarian Empire. Now, what happens, I know quite a bit about this because I studied it, this particular part, and I used to teach it when I taught A levels in England. And one of the things was that uh, the dual monarchy came about in the year 1867. Now, of course, you're not going to need to know this detail. This is for you background, context, okay? It came around in the year 1867, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was a really interesting, the Austrian Empire as it used to be known as, was a really interesting formation because about 20% of the uh, empire was Austrian. The rest was a collection of different nationalities. And uh, the constant fear of the Austrian leaders, the, the Habsburgs, uh, they've been around for a long, long time, one of the principal dynasties in Europe, the great fear was the revolution of the nationalities, do you see? And this revolution can come about internally, of course. Or, of course, great powers are at their most susceptible and their weakness, weakest after a defeat in war. Now, when the, when the Germans were unifying in the 1860s, the state of Prussia fought a war against the state of Austria. Everybody expected Austria to win, but they lost. Prussia won. That was in 1866. As a result, the, the, the minorities within the Austrian Empire were clamouring for independence. And the solution of the Austrian leaders, the Habsburg leaders, was the dual monarchy. They raised the status of the most important minority group to equality within the empire. They raised the status of the Hungarians to be equal of that of the Austrians. Griffith read this. Griffith read this. He was a great he was a journalist. Uh, he read this and he said, um, well, you know, there's clamorings within the British Empire. This is an Irish. Maybe not as strong as the Austrian Empire, but there is clamorings, particularly in places like India, you know, and the Dominion, later on become the Dominions, Canada, New Zealand, and they want a, a certain amount of devolution or home rule. So, he thought that if the British Empire raised the status of the Irish to equality within the British Empire, well, then that might solve the problems of the British Empire. And so he came up with this rather strange sort of ideology based around a dual monarchy. Uh, but it wasn't a seller. It wasn't a seller. Republican is easier. Republican is, is much easier to understand. And home rule is easier to understand. So he concept of what he was selling, but this was what he did. Now that's important and it's not important, right? We're talking about an introduction here, so we'll really talk about a quarter of a page. Well, all I said there might take two or three pages, but we don't want that. We just want the concept of the dual monarchy in there. The point being that Griffith was not a republic. That's the point. And we're going to see a contrast with that later on, okay? How the republican... Yeah. The drive towards republicanism takes over everything in 1916. He also had uh, some other ideas. Okay, now that's what I'm saying. Intro. Uh, introducing Griffith, the middle way, the right, and the year 1905. Paragraph one. Then I'm going to develop Griffith's important ideas. This is pre 19. 16, okay.
Now, so for the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, Something. Revival, and hence the name Shin Fein. Ourselves alone. He chooses an Irish name. This is a product of the um, of the uh, the Gaelic revival. And you have to say, you have to say that when he chose his name, it become one of the most important names in Irish political thought in the last century, hasn't it? Okay, so that's that Sinn Féin. That's the first thing that we need to write down. His second great idea is she creates a fire. Abstention. Right, home rulers believed in Contesting Parliament, contesting elections, getting elected, and forming a lobby within the House of Commons. Okay. IRB didn't believe in any political activity at all in terms of that, the ballot box. So the Home Rulers dominated Irish politics. The Home Rules had dominated Irish politics since the 1870s, since the 1860s, really. Okay. Uh, so Sinn Fein says we're going to contest elections. This is what this Griffith's great idea, if you like. We're going to text, uh, contest elections, and uh, what we're going to do then is abstain, like the boycott campaign of the Land League. We're going to abstain from the British Empire. We don't, we, we don't uh, recognise the authority of the British Parliament over Ireland, and so abstention will be the politics, which Sinn Féin still do today with the British Parliament, with the seven UK MPs they have from Northern Ireland. They don't sit. They don't sit. This was a big story last year with Brexit, of course. Abstentions in Parliament. Okay. Uh, what are Br uh, Griffith's other great ideas? Well, Griffith was particularly interested in the economic sovereignty. This idea that you need to have some sort of economic independence in order to have political independence. Now that's really very, very important too, I think, in uh, Griffith's ideology. Uh, and one that's underplayed, I mean, it, it's all the political stuff. Between 1912 and 1922, the Irish Revolution, that period, 20, 1923, sorry, uh, it, that, it, it's all about the political things. And people like Pierce and uh, uh, maybe later on, people like Collins and De Valera, they might have ignored the economic aspect of things. Uh, Griffith was aware of these things, and he said it was very, very important, this idea of economic sovereignty. Um, in the 30s, we see De Valera uses this uh, economic self-sufficiency as a, as a form of an expression of sovereignty. Uh, do I have enough there for a paragraph? Probably. So we go on to paragraph two, and we're going to... And we look at Griffith's other ideas, okay? So abstentions, parliament, economic uh, sovereignty, uh, and uh, also he was a journalist, okay? So he believed in the power of the written word. Now you all know that when Griffith went into town in 1916, in Easter week. He was surprised, as anybody else, by the rising. It was carried out in complete secrecy by these IRB people. And he went into the GPO, and he turned up, and he said, here I am, I'm, I'm ready to fight for Ireland, like a lot of people did. And they said, you'd be better off going home and fighting for Ireland with your pen. And of course, that turned out to be the great victory, didn't it? The power of the written words, OK. So he'd set up a, a, a newspaper. The English Irish man, it was, uh, uh, and again, this was this uh, newspaper uh, that he set up and he used his propaganda there. Um, Griffith could be a difficult uh, political guy. He was quite opinionated. It was doing about 5,000 copies per week in 1913, okay? And if we contrast that with the, uh, it was a weekly paper, if we contrast that with the Irish worker, 
which was the Labour Party's paper, they were doing 100,000 copies a week. So Griffith's party was small, very, very small on the fringes. His last really interesting idea that, British, uh, that Griffith was Proportional representation, representation as a voting system, as opposed to first past the post. First past the post was a system, and still is used in UK elections. Those of you who voted recently, in January, period, would uh, have a of candidates where you 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 voted them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in order of preference, and uh, this system was brought in eventually. In, uh, in order that uh, all areas of the community would be represented. That's called proportional representation, single transferable vote. That's the system that we have today. And it's a, it's a great system. Well, I love elections. I think it's a great system. It's great fun. It's like, a, it's like voting in the Eurovision Song Contest, but better because it's real. Uh, and uh, that's what they use. The British use first past the post. You go in and you got four choices and you put an X beside one, one candidate gets elected. So Griffith, Griffith was an early pioneer of these ideas. Some of his ideas were a little bit academic and weighty and maybe went over the head of the Irish public, if that doesn't sound too patronising. Uh, but the economic sovereignty, the dual monarchy, well, 5,000 copies a week, so he didn't have much of a following. So this is Griffith floundering away in the sea of nationalist groups in the period up to 1916, he was a nationalist, there's no doubt about that. Okay, So, uh, let's get on to, of course, the stuff that you'll be more familiar with. And uh, we go paragraph three with this one. I always wonder, was uh, 1916, 1916, two... Uh, was it good for Griffith or not? I mean, in a way, it's great, you know, this revival of national spirit. But he loses control of his own baby, if you like. Uh, he's going to have to give up Sinn Féin. And it's not due to anything he does, really. Okay? It's the fact that in 1916, we have the Sinn Féin rising from our friends in the Irish Times. The Irish Times was a unionist paper at that time. And uh, here we are with our headline, Sinn Féin Rising. They were the ones that were getting out the information. The Independent were publishing that week. Shin uh, Irish Times were publishing, getting out the way. And they were coming out with these Sinn Féin Risings. There's examples of them in your book. There's examples of the, of the, of the newspaper headlines in your book. Uh, and uh, there we see it. The Sinn Féin Rising, okay, uh, on pages uh, 61, all right. So everybody started calling it the Sinn Féin Rising. Now, that's not just due to the Irish Times, okay, because people were calling the volunteers and the ones that, when the split in the volunteers happened in 1914, and the national volunteers went to fight in the First World War, and the Irish volunteers, the minority, stayed at home, the group that used to go, maneuvers in the Phoenix Park and were often called shinners, like we call Sinn Féin people today, shinners, okay? And we, we've got that sort of um, blanket term. So, Sinn Féin rebellion, okay? That's a huge sort of thing. And uh, the public image then associates Sinn Féin with the rising. And there's big consequences of this, the big consequences of this. And then we have, of course, what we call now this happens throughout 1917 and 1918 it's a slow process often an uncertain process as to how it will go right uh, Shinners or Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin rebellion this switch in public opinion as well must be captured in your essay all right yeah the And maybe in your essay you can say it a little bit more eloquently than switch. 
in public opinion. Not the, not, not the best word to use there, but uh, we'll leave that up to you and, uh, and what you can come up with. All right, so um, uh, the, the public opinion thing is important uh, because the bit of beneficiaries of the, the change in public opinion are going to be Sinn Féin. Uh, if we go to paragraph four then, okay, paragraph four, I'm going to work, focus now on the years 1917 to 1918 and uh, yes the emergence of Sinn Féin is the representation of Irish nationalism this, of course, culminates in the election of December 1918, Sinn Féin's great breakthrough, right? But we have De Valera Now, the question is about the development of Sinn Féin. It's not about Arthur Griffith. But Arthur Griffith stood aside. I don't think Arthur Griffith really saw himself as the leadership material. De Valera was the man. And De Valera emerged in 1917, 1980, this leader of Irish nationalism. I have to say Irish nationalism. It's Sinn Féin. It's the Republicans. There's an alliance here between the political and the extra-political, right? Or the extra-parliamentary, the violent, if you like, okay? And so De Valera president here of Sinn Féin, 1917, 19, uh, the 1918 Ardèche, and then really good for de Valera's reputation, he gets arrested by the British in the German plot. This is even better. Okay. So the political is reorganised, and it had been reorganised in the camps, uh, which took place after 1916. Okay. And of course, we have then the De Valera, by the way, is ex-president of Sinn Féin and president of the Irish Volunteers. So it shows his position that he emerged at. Okay. Uh, I think De Valera is still uncertain about his uh, leadership role at that time, but we don't really need to go into that in our essays, do we? They begin to contest by-elections. Really, really quite interesting because you, 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 when we in history we like to see these things as an inevitable rise going one way, and that's really what seemed to be happened. They start to contest these by-elections. Okay, the first one get elected as Count Plunkett in Roscommon. The father of Joseph Plunkett, one of the ex members of the 1916 Rising. Then comes McGuinness, <laughs> Joseph McGuinness in Longford, and Valerian Clare three successes in a row. Everybody thinks this is a steamroller. But then, three failures, three whole rulers beat the Sinn Féiners. When these guys got elected, they refused to take their seat in the British Parliament. Along with Griffith's idea of abstention. Okay? Griffith's idea of abstention from Parliament. And so this must be mentioned and reinforced here by this point here. All right then, and that leaves us then at paragraph four with the election of 1918. It's December 1918. So, Sinn Féin equals 73, Home Rule equals six, Unionist equals 26. It's so important, this election, really, you know, it's such a big thing. First of all, it's, it's an historic election with the working class and women getting the vote for the first time. The electorate is 30% to 70%. So they were bound to get great changes. Uh, even in Britain, you have the rise of the Labour Party now uh, at the expense of the Liberal Party. Sinn Féin get the 73 seats. Uh, this system here, uh, first past the post, which I mentioned earlier, which um, Griffith was against, helped them in, the, in 1918. Okay. So Sinn Féin got the 73 seats. Home Rule got six. They're gone. They're gone. All right. 
Home rule politicians actually reinvent themselves later on and merge into the other groups. Politicians are good at that sort of thing. Uh, and then the unionists, 26. So we did an essay on partition, an essay plan on partition in the lesson uh, recently. <laughs> Not. This election was very important in the polarisation of Irish politics between unionist and nationalist at the end of World War I. Of course, World War I was entering and we had the Spanish flu. Okay, I'll say no more about that. It doesn't go in your essay either, right? Uh, it's interesting though, the Spanish flu as well. It's history, it's interesting. Okay, so paragraph five. We could talk about the first, the first dog in house in town, and they set up on the 21st of January 1918. They all abstained, all 73 abstained. Well, 73 abstained, 38 of them were in jail. So 35 of them abstained. The other 38 didn't have any choice because of the German plot, right? So the 35 meet in the mansion house and they make this proclamation that the doll is the new government of 32 County Ireland, okay? Now, of course, you can make that claim for the areas which Sinn Féin won. Can you make that claim for the area that Sinn Féin didn't? I, I have partition in mind here, you know? Um, and... Uh, The first stall. Carry out uh, Griffith's policy of abstention. Okay, and of course we have this um, uh, system in 1919 where on the meeting of the first stall, the day of the first stall, we have the beginnings of the violent campaign. So we can see how this unity between the two sides, it's a, a nice little bit of irony or twists. Uh, Griffith rejected IRB and Home Rule as not practical things. And second Sinn Féin sort of united these two groups in a new form of nationalism. So the first all was the legitimate embodiment of the Irish people's will, according to de Valera. And at the same time, we have a violent campaign beginning on the same day, the 21st of January 1919. That's when the two men are shot down, the two policemen are shot down in Tipperary and their arms stolen. This begins, of course, this uh, war of independence which lasts from 21st of June, 21st of January, sorry, like the first doll, 21st of January, 1919, true to the 21st of July, 1921, a two-year campaign, okay? Uh, very, very interesting. What are Sinn Féin doing? Well, they got the first doll, they got the... the local government council, transferred our allegiance away after the uh, local elections away from the British government to the first doll right they've got the Sinn Féin courts you've got the war of independence all of these happening and then you've got the second doll Lots in this paragraph, lots in this paragraph, okay? Uh, you don't need to go into too much detail here. You do need to mention the Sinn Féin courts. You do need to mention the local government. You do need to mention the overall strategy. The overall strategy was to make British rule in Ireland unworkable. On a level for the police, on a level for the courts, on a level for government. The three pillars of how society runs, okay? So the judges, the police, that, that system there, the political system, the local system, right? It all collapses. So British rule is not being enforced. You have a situation of sort of anarchy in Ireland as a result. This in turn then would force the British government to do one of two things. Either recognise Sinn Féin and the Dáil as the legitimate government of Ireland or impose direct rule impose direct rule. Now this is a bit of a gamble because they didn't feel Lloyd George would impose direct rule. One, because of the British public. Two, because of America. The American opinion. So trying to get all that in is hard. And 
all of this is for, for forcing George, Lloyd George into some sort of response, and this is, leads us, of course, into the Government of Ireland Act, which you know from your partition. The Government of Ireland Act provides elections for the South. That's what the second doll is based on. All right, lots there. I'm just going to go back to this section of the board. I'm going to have to uh, rub off a, a, a part of it to do my graph six, and we're towards the end here, nearly done. Paragraph five, paragraph six. The truth. The Anglo Irish Treaty, De Valera, the London, Collins goes to London, they're all Sinn Fein representatives. Okay, and Sinn Féin split over the treaty. Okay. Yeah. Jan 1922. De Valera walks out. Okay. And if you're an anti de Valera person, try to try to keep it nice and neutral, okay? Uh, if you're a pro Collins per person, try to keep it ni nice and neutral. The Sinn Fein split, okay? And this, of course, leads to and this leads to. is down. This leads to okay, and of course there's the three-way split because out here you have Sinn Fein, which leads to modern Sinn Fein, which took on its current embodiment about the year 1981. So. Isn't it a nice little bit of symmetry that we've got the three biggest parties in uh, the recent election? 37 seats, 37 seats, 35 seats. Okay. And they all come from the same source. You can bring that into your essay. You can make it one line. Okay. One line. It's not really relevant. But we know it's relevant, don't we? Okay. Good. So uh, that could be in your conclusion, that little bit that I told you about. It, um, so we've got our anti-treaty Sinn Féin split, 57 against, 64 for against. Now you do need to get in here. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have done all that. That's in your conclusion. Right. I always find that interesting though, you know. Yeah. Sinn Féin split, and then you're going to look at civil war. Nineteen twenty two to nineteen twenty three. Death of Griffith and Allens. Right, and then we'll have our conclusion. In your you mentioned that part about the uh, the, the uh, Fina Fall, Fina Gale, Sinn Fein thing, okay. That's one of the things. I think that could be the last line of your essay, in fact. Um, but you must mention this idea of uh, what we call civil war politics. That, that the two major groups were split on the civil war. Ireland, in other words, didn't develop a class system politics space where you had a left-wing party and a right-wing party. You had two centre-right parties, although Fianna Fáil say, Fianna Fáil say they're, they're, they're centre-left as well as centre-right because they want to be everything. But you have the two centre-right parties there vying for power, okay, uh, throughout the history of Satan. This is what they call civil war politics, because uh, people, political scientists would look at them, or political scientists would look at them and say, well, what is actually the ideological differences between the two? Uh, now, there are ideological differences.
between the two, but we don't have the time to get talking about it. We also talk about the shadow of the Republic here. And the mixed success of Sinn Féin. That's going to be up to you. Was Sinn Féin successful or not? Successful and not successful at the same time. Okay, and that's our essay on Sinn Féin 1912 to 1923.